Yeah, well, of course, in, in complexity, right? I mean, it really sets it sets the tone, right? Yes, indeed. So we do a and we do a course on systems thinking, as I mentioned to you, and quite a bit on complexity. So uh, the Kinetic framework comes in handy, as does the you know another one that I find really helpful in this work is is the Ken Wilber's um, mm. uh, integral quadrants. Yes, the whole domain, right? Mm. Very useful. I find that very helpful to connect the inner, the inner individual interior to the collective exterior where public policy takes place. And uh, the individual interior where uh, spirituality lies more or less. It's an interesting way to think about it and to. Definitely, definitely. Actually, that connection you are mentioning, Arej, it's a the main blind spot, right? <laughs> it has been the, the policy blind spot as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're right. That's, I mean, your work demonstrates that also. Excellent. So um, we are getting uh, our audience all uh, entering now. So. Let's just give it one more minute. Um, sure. Joseph, and then we will get started. Let me see. Our two discussants are here, Jaya and uh, Anand. Uh, hope. <clears throat> Anand here. Hi, Anand. Uh, so um, maybe uh, we will. Um, Ask Jaya to go first after the presentation and uh, share her thoughts, and then you, Anna. That okay? Uh, yes, bro. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I just learned from Joseph that he will not use a PowerPoint today. He's going to tell stories. So that's interesting. You guys saw his PowerPoints already, anyway. The students. Yeah. We did. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I um, I think it's as good a time as any. Uh, um, Anant or Jaya, either of you want to use PowerPoint slides? Do you need presentation rights to share screen? Do you have any sh screen sharing to do? Uh, prof, no, I did not prepare any PowerPoint. Yeah. No, I just want to. Yeah. That's fine. So if you need it, then we will ask Rahul to uh, give you. Okay, right. And uh, but maybe Rahul, you can give uh, hosting rights to uh, to Chesta and Divya. Rahul, you're there with us. Chesta, do you have um, hosting rights? Uh, no, Professor Singh. Uh, only Rahul ID is the host. So maybe uh, you can check with him, send him a message or something, and. Yes, I will. Yeah, OK. All right, well, welcome to all. I think we'll get started now. So we are happy to have uh, Professor Cole again with us. He gave us a great lecture on the um, uh, last few days. Uh, that would have been on Wednesday, uh, <clears throat> which was great. And um, we thought we should have him do a broader uh, sweep of his book in whatever way he chose to do it. And, uh, and then we will have uh, some two discussions, uh, Jaya Bonam and uh, Anantram, um, who will then reflect on what uh, the work that Joseph presents and the book, and the, including the lecture that he did. Um, it's all one story. And then we will have questions and answers from the, the participants as a whole. So most of you know, uh, Joseph already, he is an academic and, uh, at DA, DA, uh, the business school, and he is also uh, active consultant in the corporate sector, as well as with the UN system, in which he has been um, trailblazing this kind of thinking. And of course, uh, as we all know, he's the author of the book on Buddhist and Taoist systems thinking for sustainable development transformation. So without any further ado, uh, I will now turn it over to Professor Cole. Joseph, over to you. Thank you so much, 
Professor Naresh, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure, you know. Uh, I enjoyed a lot uh, uh, last Wednesday. Uh, uh, and I also, uh, for me, it's an opportunity and a pleasure to have the second chance uh, to talk about the main ideas behind the book. Uh, yeah. Today, and, and I know that some of the people joining today, they were also in the lecture last Wednesday. But, uh, you know, you will see that I will approach it uh, through a different perspective uh, uh, today. That's why I decided not to use a PowerPoint. <laughs> I prepared the PowerPoint, but it was this morning, you know, do, uh, doing my nature walk that I said, no, 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 no more PowerPoints today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I had, I, I had to listen to my intuition, right? <laughs> That's right. And, and so, so I, I prepared some talking points, obviously, but, uh, but uh, well, let, let me also, first of all, um, uh, say that, um, I mean, um, I'm very honored and, and, and I approach uh, this talk, uh, also my lecture last Wednesday with a deep sense of respect uh, and, and, and especially gratitude as well, that comes with respect and, and also of responsibility, because I mean, you uh, uh, even though I'm from Barcelona now, eh, the place is India, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You are in India, uh, so placing is very important eh, in this new business paradigm or development paradigm that some uh, people call it. And and I, I mean, this is the cradle of uh, the cradle of Buddhism. And uh, I mean, it's a, it's a place full of wisdom. And I'm let me let me share an anecdote an anecdote I had uh, in my first trip to India. That was uh, in 2001, so it's around 20, 21 years ago. And I was, uh, I, um, uh, I, I had scheduled actually uh, a meditation retreat in Pushkar. And as I went there, it was my first time in India. I, ha I heard ma many different things, but you know what uh, happened? Um, I couldn't, I couldn't go to the retreat. Since I uh, pu uh, put my, my footsteps in Pushkar and I started feeling I couldn't go with the retreat because I saw many, many things that were, you know, that 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 made, that made me feel that I was in a very high spiritual place, but in a place that also had other things, right? And uh, so I don't know why I, I just couldn't. I just couldn't uh, go to the retreat, and instead I went with my Indian friend uh, uh, Poke uh, to the uh, to Jaisalmer, and we had a very a very uh, interesting three days walk uh, uh, throughout the desert. And then there I could reflect upon um, why I couldn't go to the retreat. And it was not because of India, <laughs> because I was not ready. So um, I, I, I understood that, um, that uh, uh, sometimes listening to ourselves, and in that case, it was, it was my body that was saying, listen, Joseph, you, you don't have to go there. My, my, my rationality couldn't grasp why. <laughs> so I, I was very much frustrated. But uh, it was my, the first trip I had in India. Um, that, that trip was for me very important because I was traveling. I took, uh, well, I come from, from, from the business world. Uh, I, did, I studied economics and business management uh, in Spain. And then I, I work as a consultant. I work in several industries in marketing and innovation. So that was my background. I even set up my own business, uh, fashion brand, with a with a colleague and partner, and and I could see how beautiful a business can be, especially because it allows you to collaborate, meet people, bring talent, and innovate. So, which is uh, to me what attracted me most of the business world. But it uh, it also I could also see uh, the extractive nature of doing business, which uh, is at the core of what we call the Anthropocene. Right, this context in which you know it's human action that is provoking negative and rapid geological changes on the earth, and we can talk about wicked problems, and we can talk about uh, sustainable development challenges, whatever we call it, right? And and it's especially it's this economic system our ancestors invented, right? And that we are of course <laughs> permeating uh, uh, we, if we don't reflect upon it and if we don't change it, and much of you know what we are trying to do here and what you are trying to do. Which, by the way, Naresh, I, I, it's very inspiring. I mentioned that I've shared what you do in your center with my colleagues, uh, not only in Spain, but in other parts of the world. And, mm -hmm. and it's really enlightening. So uh, I, I, I think you, sh you should know that, eh? that feedback. Thank you. Thank you. That it's inspiring also other people that had some ideas, but they, they didn't dare no? to, to call spirituality to right. something they were doing. <laughs> So, so congratulations for that, and it's it's having an impact. So I, I wanted to to let you know, at least from my humble perspective. <laughs> yeah. 
So um, uh, let me close this bracket and, and continue with that story. So, so I saw, I put also Phil and, 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 and I felt a, a little uh, bad for that, you know, and then I decided, well, Joseph, you know, I think that there are more things in the world. So I, I, uh, we sold with my partner, we sold our, our brand actually. And with the savings, uh, um, well, my partner went to New York um, and uh, myself, I started backpacking around the world. I started in Africa, you know, uh, very close to Spain. And, and from Africa, then I went to India, I had that experience and I end up in, 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 the, in the Far East. So here it comes, <laughs> my relationship, uh, my first, uh, you know, the relationship uh, I, I, I have with uh, Buddhism and Taoism, I became very much enlightened, you know, uh, by, by those philo philosophies and I wanted to, to know more about it. And, and, and I will develop some of the ideas because I think that's important. And, and before we started, we kicked off this event. We were talking about the inner uh, interior quadrant of Wilbur, right? Mm -hmm. So it all starts here. <laughs> so uh, so that, that was my particular way to, to be aware of that quadrant. And I didn't know about Wilbur at that time. <laughs> but but uh, I ended up in, in Seoul, in South Korea, where I started working uh, as the project manager of a, a business incubation center that uh, in the Kyonggi province that was aimed at sustainable development. So, so then my interest was in exploring other ways beyond business uh, that could be helpful for the well-being of the society and the planet. And that started in South Korea. For me, a very interesting country because it's been the fastest developed country in the world, right? It developed in around 30 years, whereas in Europe, for example, countries like mine, Spain, or other countries in Europe, they've yeah. developed 120, 150 years. So I wanted to know what happened there. So it allowed me, you know, to put a lot of uh, study and effort uh, in, in development economics. I started my PhD on that, uh, based on innovation and sustainable development. And, and there I started also uh, working on um, the domain, uh, the domain of uh, international cooperation. So uh, it's when I started working in projects by the European Commission. And actually, uh, later on, uh, I uh, started working with the United Nations in, in entrepreneurship and sustainable development. So it was, it was for me a, a, a way, you know, to start connecting, to start connecting with a, a way of doing things beyond business. And um, that happened in, in, in South Korea, where I had the opportunity, uh, colleagues, to, to spend uh, around 10 years of, of my life. And then to conduct uh, evaluations and, and projects in, in international development, in innovation and, and entrepreneurship are, uh, around more than 45 countries uh, around the world. And then I had the opportunity to live in Brussels as I was uh, part of a team that we set up uh, a research committee in the European Parliament on, on development, actually. It was the first time uh, to set it up in, in the European Parliament because the European Parliament was uh, issuing policies on development and without a, a research body. So that was a contribution at that time, that was in 2010, more or less. I went also to Indonesia. I lived in Jakarta uh, for some time, working and also in a, in a development project uh, related to energy transition. So, and then also to Tanzania, where, where um, um, I set up with some colleagues there, an innovation department in a university, in a new, in a brand new university, which is now the, the largest university in the east part of Africa. It's called the University of Dodoma. And uh, so that, that allowed me to, to, uh, to try to understand the world and to connect with, uh, with uh, another part of systems thinking, which is you know, thinking is around, thinking is the idea of uh, organizing information so that we can make decisions, decisions that are useful to our own survival and our own well-being, right? And systems thinking is doing that you know, in the process of trying to understand the world and the systems uh, by which the world works, right? So that's, uh, that's to me something that has always been with me. And so, I could, I could say that I, 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 I not always considered myself a system thinking because I didn't know I was, <laughs> you know, but then uh, I considered that it was something natural in me, you know, trying to, to, to grasp those understandings. And uh, let me now make you a, a visualization. So if you just can concentrate uh, for a moment, uh, if you just can close your eyes for a moment and paint, paint yourself uh, a picture, okay, of a triangle. Uh, just, just draw a triangle in your minds. And in the bottom uh, vertice, in one vertice, uh, you, put, you put Buddhism and Taoism, all right? In another vertice, you, you write, you draw uh, systems thinking. 
And at the top, the one at the top, you write sustainable development. Okay, so just have this frame, ha have this framework in mind because we are gonna explore the relationships huh, between these three vertices about this triangle, all right? Because it, it's what this book is about. And it's been, uh, well, I wrote that book quite recently, but, but uh, those things I, I write about come from, from uh, 10, 15 years of experience uh, and, and validation. And of course, it's my perspective. Huh? Um, to me, it's very difficult to, to write about, uh, I mean, you cannot just write uh, purely about Buddhism or Taoism, they are perennial philosophies that are based on mystical experience, what they are called direct non-intellectual experiences, right? In order to grasp the, the sense uh, of, of what life is. So um, writing about that is just writing about the idea of Buddhism or the idea of Taoism. So I wanted also to make that explicit here. Uh, so we are writing about that, but that's a lot. Writing about the idea of that may help us get insights uh, uh, in order to uh, enter the domain of the non-direct, the direct non-intellectual experience, which is one of the main ideas of, of the book. All right, having said that, uh, why, why did I write my book? So I'm gonna focus this, this talk for the next maybe 25 minutes um, around three main things, okay? First of all, I wanted to share why did I write this book? To me, that's important to share with you uh, um, because, because it's about connecting eh, this inner interior quadrant with uh, the, 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 the contributions, the impact it can have on the exterior one and the collective. And then um, I will also share um, what is Buddhist and Taoist system, system, uh, think, uh, Buddhist and Taoist system thinking? Eh? What is? And also why I wrote that book. <laughs> I think that's important because Especially, you know, um, I mean, we, we are in a world that uh, we want on one hand to be systemic and we are learning that. I don't consider myself uh, self-realized yet. <laughs> I'm on that process. So learning about system thinking to me is an ongoing journey. And, but, but we are still very much influenced by the reductionist, you know, the Cartesian mindset. And, and, and I was educated under that paradigm colleagues. I, I mean, I was educated under the Cartesian Newtonian mindset, very much influenced uh, also by Catholicism. In my case, I come from a very conservative family in the northern part of Catalonia in Spain. And so I could, I, I had to unlearn a lot and I'm learning a lot in order, in order to allow learning. You know? As Nonaka said, so self-transcending knowledge needs first unlearning in order to learn. So that's been my case. It's one of my life stories, right? <laughs> so, and to me, you may think, oh, what Joseph, I mean, you may see a, a white guy, you know, Joseph is a Western name, right? Uh, what is he doing writing about that? <laughs> you know, well, of course, that's our, this is the tricks eh, the, the, our, of our Cartesian mindsets. You know, we see labels, right? We very much focus on identity. And when we focus on Buddhism and Taoism, it's precisely about transcending identity. And to me, this is one of the core ideas uh, of the book, that um, when we transcend duality, and to me, both Buddhism and Taoism, they are really two philosophies that allow us to transcend duality. And we may connect from a place where we are all humans, where we are all beyond our identities, beyond our labels. And to me, that's the main challenge to, to, to grasp oneness, right? Which is that concept in which we are all equal because we are everything. Uh, and we are all connected. So to me, that's very fundamental. It's the main challenge we have. So, um, uh, and uh, why did I write uh, um, this book? Well, to me, it's very important. Um, we talk about the Anthropocene. Uh, then the Anthropocene is a context uh, in which we are operating, which no longer the things, the system dynamics we had until now are no longer valid for the challenges we have. Uh, right now, climate change, inequalities of all sorts, war, conflicts, pandemics, and, and so forth. And to me, that equals to, it's kind of a new samsara. You know? The Buddhism have a very nice way to put, you know, the cycle of, uh, the, the, the suffering inherent of the cycle of life, grow, and, and death, right? So birth, we grow, we are born, we grow, we die that brings an, in, an inherent suffering in life or life dissatisfaction that can be manifested in different forms. So to me, um, Buddhism and Taoism are two ways of liberation. It can be ways of liberating from that suffering, right? The suffering that we have, that we see in the planet, that we see in the society, that we see in ourselves. 
So um, to me, that's uh, the, the teachings of Buddhism and Taoism are still more valid maybe than even before, you know, the 2,500 years uh, when, when they were uh, just, uh, what they saw the light in India and later on in the rest of the, to the rest of the world. And, uh, but we have to renew, we have to renew what those universal principles mean in our context, in this um, new samsari context of the Anthropocene. And, and I think that while well, this book uh, attempts to be a contribution, a humble contribution to that, uh, in that renewal of interpreting some of the fundamental principles that I will discuss. This is to me uh, something uh, very important. The great disconnect between human and nature is actually uh, one of the main root causes of the suffering we have. Uh, uh, some people call it the illusion of separation. Some other people, I like to call it the great disconnect, right? Because, uh, and I'm not talking about the background of this, but uh, you, know, you know in order to frame it, how this is one of the main challenges of today, which is at the root cause of uh, addressing challenges like climate change or social inequalities and economic inequality. So to me, in the book, you will see that I frame that uh, uh, in two gaps. We have two gaps that this book tries to, to bridge. Huh? The first one is the consciousness gap. So we are not conscious about the great disconnect. We are not aware. We are not aware. So because we are very much in, inside the system and we very much embed also the behavior of that system, which is extractive, which is degenerative by nature that takes natural and human resources for a profit you know, and, and, and that creates negative externalities to the extent that we are even in danger, you know, in our, our, our own species. To me, I'm not a fatalist in the way that I don't know what's gonna happen with the planet, but the planet has survived far beyond us. We are very new as humans on, on earth, right? So to me, what's in really in, in danger is ourselves as human species. And, and I do believe I have a, posi a positive uh, and optimistic intake on, on the way forward, of course, otherwise I think I wouldn't be here <laughs> sharing all that with you. But I'm also very aware of the magnitude uh, of the challenges uh, we face today, right? So, but, um, and then we have a second gap and this is very important in order to contextualize why, why, why I wrote that book. Um, to me, that, that gap is the East, I call it the East-West knowledge gap. I mean, I've studied economics and business today. If we want, if we want to solve 85% more or less of the wealth we create comes from the business world, you know, the way corporations and, and entrepreneurship generate wealth. And, and with, with that wealth, we may finance our lives. We also find the public policies we launch and the public services some of us may enjoy, right? With all the challenges we have. So if we really want actually to address those global challenges, we need to change this, uh, the dynamics of the socioeconomic system. So, we have a life which is organized around the idea of work, right? We study, we are educated in order to get a job, to be productive, and then to consume. Eh? And the cycle of production and consumption is the cycle that defines the Anthropocene. That's why I make the analogy with the new samsara, right? So it's the, how we break that, how we make an economic system that is really regenerative by design, which can really regenerate the natural ecosystems, the social communities in which we we'll live. An economic system that that really um, has a different uh, uh, and uh, 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 intake and understanding of growth more in line with nature. So, how do we design an economic system that takes nature as a role model, not just something in which we extract resources? So, this is to me a, a, a fundamental framing question. And and the East West knowledge gap uh, means that some of the fun the fundamental theories in economic theory in the way we do business come from, from the West. They are intellectually born in the West. Eh? And so we can make a quick exercise. Just think about the economic theories, the business and management models you have been uh, studying uh, in, in, in your own, if you have studied economics or business administration. So you may come with, you know, Porter's five forces and the competitive strategy and the, and the business model canvas and the four piece of Philip Kotler. And we can go on and on and on. Even in the East, uh, what, uh, because I've been, I've been teaching uh, for so many years and I do every year. To Yon I go to Yonsei University and I teach a course. And, and, and I, I know that uh, the syllabus of those uh, universities uh, in those majors are still very much influenced by this kind of thinking. And, and we haven't tapped into the potential of Eastern wisdom eh, in order to actually enter wisdom that is very much needed to that redesign, to, to reset the system. So to me, the book has a fundamental premise, which is 
we need we, we need Eastern wisdom for this sustainability transformation, for getting into this new business paradigm. So without that, without that Eastern wisdom, uh, I don't think we are going to make it. And, and now I'm going to explain why. And that's my perspective. That's I'm going to share. I'm going to share why I consider that. To, to, to me, that's a fundamental premise. Without this Eastern wisdom, I don't think we are going to make it. Uh, and uh, so um, why, why I say that? Well, first of all, first of all, and, and to me, that's something um, very important. Um, Taoist and Buddhist were the earliest systems thinkers. <laughs> and uh, some people say, well, Joseph, why do you say that? <laughs> How about other indigenous uh, philosophies that were systemic? And that's absolutely right. So I'm saying they, are, they were the first earlier systems thinkers uh, because they recorded uh, the, the thinking they elaborated. They put it in, in black and white, <laughs> you know? So we have early records of that, like uh, the first systemic theories like the yin and yang and the five elements, which I largely explore in the book and I apply them for in methodologies uh, that help us uh, uh, lead, uh, lead to, towards sustainable development. So they recorded those. Other indigenous philosophies, to me, they were they are absolutely critical and key and important. So of course it's about bridging. Yeah? I'm not just choosing. Uh, I'm just sharing why I consider they were the earliest system thinkers because we they recorded uh, their own thinking. And so they were researchers that were exploring the relationships between nature and a human being, and they elaborated uh, abstract ways of um, putting it into theories, you know, like the yin and yang and uh, five elements and we have early evidence of that uh, of thousands of years ago so and of course if we can also connect with any indigenous philosophy which is based on a perennial wisdom so my my departure point is secular spirituality uh, it's the concept of perennial philosophies and i take buddhism and Taoism as that and to me that's uh, that's very fundamental uh, um, they were early system thinkers uh, we can also we can really learn from those already systemic theories that were connected are systemic theories that are connected with the main consciousness uh, with the consciousness of life uh, uh, from from a mystical experience and 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 to me that's really something fundamental I remember and I appreciate, I really appreciate my, uh, the editor of my book uh, was uh, Gerald Mitchley, uh, which is a very good colleague. Uh, it's, he is a renowned system scientist. And he was actually, uh, one of the, the things that attracted him was how this was clearly expressed. You know? uh, that, that connection that sometimes is a missing point also in system science. So in system science and in science in general, there's the absence of the observer. We, we don't take into consideration the level of consciousness of the observer and the way the observer uh, uh, and the potential of the observer can have in order to influence and change the system. This is still very much uh, unexplored by the current scientific paradigm. Also in system science, uh, uh, this is my intake. So the first, the first thing, for example, Buddhism um, uh, has one of the main ideas, which is we are all bodhisattvas. We, we cannot, and that's the work of Shantideva. It's a wonderful work. And um, so we very much, we very much can be empowered to change the system, uh, uh, and and have this um, this power comes from the inner realization that we are all influence, uh, influencing the system since the first moment we are observing that system. So the bodhisattva uh, realizes about the power of influence that he or she has in the system, and to me that's really critical. And that's something we really can learn a lot, uh, in that case, from Buddhism. That's one of the main uh, ideas behind why uh, these Eastern uh, philosophies are so fundamental. The second one is also about the process of how we know about things. So we've been very much influenced, and I, 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 uh, I, I spoke about that, about this Cartesian Newtonian, the, rash the rational paradigm that was initiated in the scientific revolution in the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, with authors like Francis Bacon, Rene Descartes, and, uh, and later on uh, Isaac Newton, and so on, which were very critical for the advance of science as we know it. So uh, it, this has to be knowledge, but it's not enough in order to understand how the world really works. So, and, and to me, that's very, that's very important. And cognition really starts uh, from, from perception. And uh, perception starts always with feelings and emotions. And to me, that's a fundamental idea that the Buddhist and 
Tau systems thinking have been exploring for, for long. It's something that the latest uh, uh, quantum physics research is, and neuroscience is also getting to similar conclusions. And we have, we have here the work of Barella, eh, which uh, also he went to Buddhism to uh, elaborate the concept of the embodied mind. Eh? We always learn feeling first. And, and, some, and somehow we work and we operate in a system in which feelings are not recognized. And this is also the work of Antonio Damasio. Damasio no? His book on the stranger order of things taps into that particular uh, idea. So to me, we have to get back into connecting with our own deep intuition and, our, uh, and expanding our levels of perception. And here, both Buddhism and Taoism offer, they offer uh, uh, great techniques to work with another idea that, yeah, that is there in Eastern wisdom that, and we, that we don't find in the West, which is that we can work on our minds from the no mind. So uh, techniques like meditation, techniques like Tai Chi, Qi Kong, those techniques allow us to work on our mind to, to expand our level of perception and understanding of the world without, without an intellectual exercise. And this, this to me was a breakthrough in my life. That was a, a completely breakthrough. Um, so the, 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 the way cognition works, I think we, we can learn a lot from Buddhism and Taoism, especially in that systemic perspective. And then there's, there's another idea, which is very important, which uh, we are, when we are talking about feelings and emotion, it's the idea of energy. This, also, this is also th something that, that quantum physics is coming uh, uh, to, to understand. But many years later, right? And to me, that's amazing. It, it amazes me how, how the recent discoveries that uh, from science, in that case, from quant quantum science, you say, oh my God, but this was already discovered thousands of years ago by Taoism and, and Buddhism. So how is that possible? So to me, this is only possible because those people had a very you know, uh, expanded level of perception, right? Uh, uh, so they were operating from a, 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 a field of consciousness that allowed them to identify that from the experience, uh, from their own interior experiences. And to me, that's very, very, very important. Max Planck, for example, no, which is uh, one of the founders of quantum science, no? Max Planck uh, already, already said that the conscious experience is the energetic motivator. So that's why tapping into that conscious experience, the, the direct non-intellectual experience is so important, and this has been largely in, uh, inquired in Buddhism and Taoism. To me, some people may, may ask, well, Joseph, why do you put Buddhism and Taoism? They are different. Yes, they are. But there's one uh, since Bodhidharma traveled from India to China, and they met with a place with Chinese that they were Taoist by nature. They really like each other, no? And I'm going to simplify now, but from the merging and the, the symbiotic interaction between Buddhism and Taoism, Zen was born, no? and Zen, Zen Buddhism, which, uh, which is uh, this interwoven relationships between Buddhism and Taoism. And to me, and this is one of the main syntheses, and I think that uh, one of the main contributions of this book is that uh, I synthesize the, the, the common principles that Buddhism and Taoism share, which are systemic by nature. And that's why I call them Buddhist and Taoist system thinking. And uh, I, I will go to those principles in, in just a second. But, um, but it's uh, so that, that idea of that uh, quantum science or modern science is actually getting into some conclusions that Buddhist and Taoists arrived many years ago still amazes me a lot. And this is something that I discussed with uh, Fritjof Capra, uh, which is a good colleague. And uh, Fritjof Capra made a great contribution in uh, 1975 with uh, Tao physics, right? And he writes about and he says uh, parallels between. Uh, uh, um, Eastern wisdom and modern science, to me, there's a resemblance. I think it's even, even something uh, closer, uh, more in intricate, and there's a resemblance between the two. And from, it's interesting that from two different ways of inquiry, we are getting into that uh, unity, that it's very much fundamental to understand the nature of life. So that was a, a very interesting idea. Energy is, um, well, emotions, we talk about feelings, emotions as, a, as the starting point of knowing. Uh, so to me, that's a fundamental idea. I could get that idea uh, when I was in Asia. So uh, 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 all this is intellectually born in East Asia because I, I was in South Korea for 10 years when I uh, experimented uh, uh, on this. I was uh, practicing Zen 
and I was studying Chinese and Taoist metaphysics on the other hand. And I was doing my work uh, at the academia and as a business consultant. And those walls were getting closer and closer and closer. Until one day I got the revelation, the insight that, oh my God, they had to be integrated. So since that day on, I quit my job that, uh, at that time and I just, you know, explored this, uh, this uh, integrated fields of study and it's been my life and, and it, 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 it's gonna be my life because it's something that you just can start and, and never ends. So there are many, many windows of learning and exploration in those fields. So um, it's very interesting that uh, energy is very is a concept that has been studied very much in Buddhism and Taoism as well. It's uh, so that there's a very nice way uh, uh, to to put how we can be um, uh, well. Energy is key for health uh, in ourselves and also in the planet, uh, as we know. So there are four fundamental ways that are complementary in order to describe energy. And this is something that uh, really, I think it's an important idea that we get from Eastern wisdom. The one is the universal knowledge, you know? We want to connect from that church, the Tao, you know? The universal knowledge, the Buddha, the, uh, to get into a state of Nirvana. So um, this is to me a, a very fundamental idea and we get energy when we grasp, you know, when we have these uh, direct experiences that are non-intellectual, this mystical experience, which Arnenez in sustainability call it deep ecology. Right? So it's that connection. But then we have the realm of heaven, which is the thoughts and emotions we have. So in order to, to, to have a, a good energy, positive energy, we also need to take care to recognize our, uh, 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 especially our thoughts. And then also our feelings and emotions, which is the earth uh, domain of energy. And finally, we have the human, uh, the human, the human being, which is, how we also take care of our body, our physical condition. So those four levels of energy, it's something that we continuously work by uh, practicing in that case, Zen, uh, anything related to Buddhism and Taoism. And that's also something very fundamental that you don't find uh, in organizations normally. I just uh, came from, from a retreat in Dubai with uh, some the resident coordinators uh, in the United Nations, and we were practicing actually how we could connect with these four levels of energy. And this is, was something that uh, it was mentioned that that was not done before. No? So we are starting doing this work also uh, in, in, in tapping into these four levels of energy, uh, which Eastern wisdom has very much uh, to offer because they have techniques that have been validated by experience for thousands of years. So um, that was also a, a, an idea. And then my final idea on why a Buddhist and Taoist system thinking is so key is the issue of control. Uh, so in the management world, both in the public and the private sector, we, we want to control things. We want to predict them. We want to control them. We want to control the outcomes of what we do. And actually, the whole uh, uh, cybernetics uh, uh, is about this, which is a, a, an important theory in systems thinking and complexity theory. Uh, so um, for long, Buddhism and Taoism have uh, worked on the idea of impermanence, on one hand, the idea of that uh, changes naturally cyclical and changing constantly. And second of all, uh, Taoism has a principle that is also found in Buddhism, which is the Wu Wei, which is doing things, uh, uh, not, 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 it not, it's not the action of non-action, but doing things uh, in favor of the natural course. So respecting the natural course of things. And that entails us uh, developing our intuition. So when we, are, uh, we talk about with Professor uh, about the Kinefin framework, right? That we live in a very complex world. Uh, more and more changes uh, are happening and more that they have to come. And we have to make decisions. Sometimes we don't have uh, the information, the data that is re required, or even sometimes we have contradictory evidence and still we need to make decisions. So being able to apply the principle of Wei is very much interesting and necessary in our learning processes and in how we make decisions in a complex world. And, uh, and to us, to me, um, uh, the principle of Wu Wei and, and the impermanence are two very important fundamental principles in Buddhist and Taoist uh, system thinking that are really critical in helping us in letting, in, in letting things go, uh, in, 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 in overcoming control, and instead focusing more on our influence, uh, respecting the natural course of things. So that's to me a fundamental idea that we can learn much in, in applying Buddhist and Taoist uh, systems thinking to those universal principles. 
So um, to summarize, uh, what is Buddhist and Taoist system thinking? To me, first, uh, the, the application of universal principles, oneness and interdependence. On one hand, we talk about that, how we grasp this mystical experience of oneness, what is the ultimate nature of reality? I think that we need that uh, spirituality is very important in that regard. Um, uh, the second is the principle of emptiness, which is how we suspend our judgment. We realize our humble nature in order that, uh, and that we are separate, uh, that we, are, we cannot be separate beings, but just beings that are connected with the rest, with other beings, and also with nature. That's also very important. And let me quote here a beautiful, a beautiful quote of uh, the, the philosopher, the Indian philosopher Nisargadatta. I think, I think he beautifully puts it. He says, when I look inside and see that I am nothing, that is wisdom. To me, that's the principle of emptiness. And when I look out and see that I am everything, that is love. And to me, that's the principle of oneness. And he says, between both, my life goes by. So that's actually the relationship between the inner and the outer world. And that, that will, that's beautifully put in these words. And uh, that's why we need, this, uh, to me, Eastern wisdom eh, in order to actually grasp eh, what is the fundamental principles of life. And, and then uh, we have the principle of Wei that I just mentioned. So these three, four principles are um, the shared principles between Buddhism and Taoism, and they are key, really necessary. They are systemic by nature. So that's one thing. And the other thing, which is very important, well, you know, and as Professor mentioned, I'm a practitioner as well. And uh, uh, so all what I do is, uh, um, uh, uh, to me, it has to be applied, it has to be tested by reality. So. I developed uh, some um, uh, what I call simplex because those are um, methodologies uh, based from Buddhist and Taoist systems thinking. And you, you will find in the book, the yin yang theory applied and the five elements applied and some of the principles and models like also T qualia and, and a, an abundance framework and the concept of business mindfulness applied to evaluation. So you will find many um, uh, Buddhist and Taoist systems thinking methodologies in the book that can be applicable, applicable that, that, that are applied, that have been applied, and, and that are evolving yeah, as, they, as they are applied, of course, because those are open source uh, methodologies. So, but it's also a collection of these methodologies because we need them. And this is something that we have discussed. I have discussed that with groups from Chinese and Western scholars that we work on systems thinking on trying to bridge Eastern and Western approaches. And, 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 and we have, uh, well, I think we, need, we have the responsibility not only to tap into that knowledge, but try to bring and apply that knowledge in methodologies that may help us bring this thinking into uh, the public policy, uh, both in the design, implementation, and evaluation, into the corporate world, into research, into education. So, so I think that's the way, and, and with this, let me finish. Uh, that uh, we, we, uh, we, are, we don't need bridges because we are the bridge and uh, we are the bridges that we need. So, so, and for that reason, to me, Buddhism and Taoist system thinking is fundamental. So, well, thank you so much for your attention and let me finish here, Professor and colleagues, uh, my talk. Wonderful as usual, uh, Joseph, thank you so much. Uh, we are going to turn to two of our students to uh, provide some commentary on your work. Before I turn to them though, uh, you know, you have provided us with a treat of ideas. Uh, I have myself have uh, looked at that journey through uh, experience of first being something, you know, you first think you are the body. Uh, we all going up, go around the world thinking we are this Naresh Singh or Jaya Bonam or Anatra or Joseph Cole something and then if we when we do get into buddhism and taoism and advaita vedanta and we do our contemplative work and uh, our meditations we do uh, in the interior find that we become nothing and then we trans we somehow move to the level at which we are uh, everything so the something to the nothing to the everything is quite intriguing we were talking among our colleagues at the center last evening about uh, quantum physics. Someone saying it can explain anything, but not everything. <laughs> and some very intriguing things. The one 
The one thing I want to flag that is so important and I found very interesting in your work is that from all these philosophical concepts, you have actually been implementing this in the multilateral system, in the United Nations system, in concrete evaluations of the work of UNFPA, with resident coordinators who are not an easy bunch to work with, as our dean, who I notice is with us uh, at this point, uh, Dean Sudarshan is with us, and he and I both served in the UN system. And we know how intransigent and you know the system can be. And uh, you have already been engaging with them, and in the business world as well. The business world, obviously, by law, must make money, right? That's their primary purpose. And it seems that they are uh, sort of encouraged by law to be more and more extractive, do whatever it takes to produce more and more for the shareholders, not the stakeholders. And um, the big shift in business at the philosophical level, it seems that it must be what this bunch of academics and business leaders have put in this book out of the Sage School of Business out of Oxford, in which they argue that the purpose of business must be to make the world a better place and in so doing make a profit, which is the complete inversion of what we've been doing with ESG and corporate social responsibility and so on, which is make a profit and then try to correct your mess. And uh, we'll come back and talk about all of that later on. And I know that uh, one of our colleagues uh, who is here as well uh, would have been delighted at your reference to Max Planck and, uh, and uh, quantum physics and so on. And uh, the fact that Planck himself recognized that consciousness was primary such a long time ago. So we'll come back and do that. But for now, I want to turn first to Jaya Bonam, who um, works with our center and has uh, taken several of my own courses and so on. So Jaya, it is uh, my pleasure now to ask you to share your thoughts on uh, Professor Cole's work. Over to you, Jaya. Yes, Professor. Um, I uh, have a very bad internet connection, so I might not be able to switch on the video, if that's okay. Um, so, yes, uh, so good afternoon, professors. Um, firstly, I would like to thank Nareso for giving me this opportunity uh, to put in my comments on the book. Um, so I would, uh, personally, I would consider myself to be very fortunate enough to have come across this book, which has been such brilliantly explained with a new concept, which we, ha we all hadn't known before, a different view given out for business and management specifically. Uh, especially which explores uh, the interconnectedness and the reconnection of humans to how they can regenerate the economy. Now, myself coming from a law and a public policy background, I have uh, in fact witnessed how organizations and especially entrepreneurs for that matter struggle to balance between uh, maximizing profits and also holding their ground on the values that one has. And uh, as uh, Professor Joseph has explained a while back, uh, about the consciousness, uh, how it could play a vital role, I think, and I also agree with him that we might uh, think we have nothing within ourselves, but eventually one gets to know uh, that there's something that binds one's self with our core values, uh, which even words can't express because our mind, uh, our mind's own understanding is beyond what we really think it is uh, with the feelings and emotions that one has. And while I was going through this book, I had a lot of questions that were popping in my head. And with all of this dilemma, it did occur that there was this one question that has come to my mind as to how these organizations, as well as the entrepreneurs could adapt to the changing times of the economy. Like, especially in the given COVID times, we have seen how drastically that our economy has changed. And at the same time, how they could uh, balance and construct to sustainable future. So uh, this book, in fact, gives out all of the answers uh, that I was looking forward to uh, through the holistic philosophies uh, that Professor Joseph has uh, put in through this book. It does offer a scientific view, uh, which also considers the complexities that our economy currently has. 
Now, um, I'm pretty sure that many of us uh, have come across uh, the terms Zen and Yin Yang, but I, I don't think applying them in thinking to achieve sustainability has something that we have come across. And I personally wasn't even aware of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's given, like it's given through uh, like the courses that I have taken, it's given that the systems that we have in our country consists of various interacting and interdependent actors, which dynamically adapt and co-evolve over time. But having gone through this book, I actually has, um, I was actually able to build a strong nexus uh, to understand their harmony, uh, where Professor Joseph has constantly brought up the interconnectedness of various elements that are coherently organized in a way to achieve things. This changes the whole perspective of how we look at the actors in any system, be it social, ecological, or economic for that matter. This book not only bridges the gap between Western and Eastern management disciplines, but also brings in the sustainable business management. Now, while I was going through the book, one of the chapters that has fascinated me was the last chapter, which was on the business mindfulness. I couldn't agree more with the fact that how purpose and accountability has led to an uh, could could lead to an impact on organizations. I mean, I do understand that complexities. Uh, uh, I do understand the complexities an organization has, but the mountain of accountability which was explained uh, through this book uh, gives a crystal clear picture of how the accountability is complementary to the level of complexity. The evaluation uh, that has been explained in three different lenses indeed gives us as to how a system could be transformed as Professor Joseph has explained now and could be made sustainable if applied. This could bring a dynamic change with such complex systems in the organizations in any country and bring out solutions for the problems that we might tend to overlook most of the time. As a policy enthusiast myself, I might be able to, like all the courses that I have taken, I might be able to evaluate to the best of my knowledge, but uh, this chapter and this book has indeed has given me a different direction and a different outlook, I would say, on how the evaluation could be done in a meaningful way, rather than, the, rather than just merely going uh, with the process and the flow of it. As uh, it, it, it's, it, it's easy for me to get in the solutions as to why it is and how to achieve it with the help of ancient theories and philosophies that the professors has put through. Furthermore, uh, the book also has indeed given out highly actionable tools like Zen business, peak volume, or business mindfulness for purpose-driven policy analysts, organizations, entrepreneurs, and even for students who might want to start the journey early that could drive a systematic transformation in various organizations at an early stage itself. I, uh, going through this book, I would, I would definitely would recommend to each and every person to go through this because it could actually change the dynamics of how we think through the systems. And I would just would like to conclude by saying that if we could look at a system through the lens of Buddhist and Taoist lenses, it could clarify the direction and parts of a major shortcomings in organizations and in many diverse and complex systems uh, for many of the entrepreneurs as let's say the entrepreneur entrepreneurship itself taken as an example is nothing but is made of interconnections between multiple economic agents and it actually implies that their success and survival are dependent to each other and hence um, i strongly believe that this could indeed create an innovative way to engage complex problems that we already have and we could actually get a more sustainable solutions if we could apply this in our real life systems. So I think you're on mute, sir, Nari, sir. Thanks very much, Jaya. I'm just saying thank you so much. And uh, uh, Joseph, if you don't mind, let's uh, hear from Anand Ram as well, and then we can uh, open up for a call. Go ahead, Anand. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Naresh, and good afternoon, Professor Joseph. So, so uh, this book is a very interesting book in the first place. Uh, why I say this is not it's not a cliche uh, way of saying it. Uh, this book uh, talk, uh, brings uh, uh, brings out a sequence of what the problems we have in the first place, and what all the options that we have uh, in front of us in terms of you know, philosophy, like the Buddhism, Taoism. 
uh, and uh, the, all the, 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 the concepts of you know, the emptiness, uh, the oneness, and everything, and how we are putting it together, and how, uh, as uh, Professor Joseph is putting them together, and how is he proposing that how the businesses can conduct themselves, right? So I like the sequence uh, uh, of uh, uh, the content. And while reading the book, okay, I, I have to be very honest, I did not read end to end all the pages in detail, uh, but I found certain uh, you know, interesting uh, sections which I went through, tried to make a connection, which I was able to make a connection with. So while reading the book, I always had, uh, I was drawing the parallels uh, with the philosophy of Dharma also, right? So. Yeah, uh, because born in India and had some exposure about them, I cannot, uh, uh, I cannot isolate myself or uh, talking about philosophy, I cannot isolate myself uh, away from Dharma. So when you talk about the Tao, which is uh, the, the Buddhist principle for deliberation, right? Um, so uh, I was actually thinking that, see, uh, I also uh, practiced Vipassana for some time. Uh, so and uh, went through the uh, you know, the discourses about the fashion and everything. So they say that all the um, uh, all all the uh, worries or all the uh, uh, things or the samsara that we go through is because of uh, our attachment to certain things. So we have to detach, detach ourselves. So all the discourses again, um, it's, it's a mix of everything. So when we're talking about uh, the principle or the philosophy of Taoism which is to liberate human suffering or humans from the suffering. Uh, how is that, you know, we uh, apply it to uh, businesses or corporations, for example, or organizations, where they are not trying to uh, uh, liberate themselves from sufferings, but they are getting into the sufferings in a way to address or find a solution. To that. So uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, connection. Uh, uh, that's an interesting question that I have. Okay, we, we are talking about a philosophy which says about uh, you know, uh, escaping samsara, but using the same philosophy to uh, getting into the samsara also, because any, as Professor Naresh told that, uh, any business will have to provide solutions in, and then in process, you no know, make the money. I understand that not, not everyone who puts in money might not understand, so that's a different debate altogether. But that's that's a very interesting uh, you know uh, point that I understood. So when I was trying to uh, connect the thing is okay, uh, Taoism and Buddhism, which is an in yang by its, uh, that combination, it's an in yang by itself, and then which talks about the uh, liberation from samsara, which is the regular issues or the thing human sufferings that we have. So when we apply that uh, uh, to the business using the, the, the management principles, uh, the, the scientific management principles, and the Taoism and Buddhism, uh, the combination of Indian and everything, it uh, some, somehow it leads to uh, something called the Karma Yoga. Uh, the, the thing is, what we say, is, uh, Karma Yoga is part of Dharma, the different types of yogas that uh, any individual can pursue. Uh, but why should someone pursue that? That's because the purpose, someone to identify, find his or her purpose in their life, they would, they can choose one form of yoga and they can continue it and they can practice it and then uh, that's how they do. So I could understand the, uh, you know, the, the, the connection between karma yoga and how the businesses can conduct themselves uh, you know, by uh, using the principles of Taoism and Buddhism. I'm not sure if, if it's right or wrong, but the connection just occurred to me while just going through the book. Um, yeah, other than, um, I also think, uh, I mean, uh, again, uh, this is, uh, um, this is a note I just wanted to show here. I don't know if, oh, sorry. Um, I just want to show a small uh, thing, diagram. Uh, can you see, Professor? Yeah, it's a bit uh, difficult to see the word. So better tell us what you have. OK. So uh, I was just thinking that the, the Taoism and Buddhism, when they can form in Yang, so that Taoism, Buddhism construct plus Dharma can also form another in Yang, recursive in Yang, because we can draw lots of parallels and uh, some mm -hmm. answers some things uh, which uh, 
which can be answered by uh, the non tao buddhism things can be found in dharma no vice versa i think they can fit very well into um, so that's what i was thinking uh, i mean by uh, when i was reading this book it's um, i was not just reading the book but it was evoking lots of uh, you know thoughts in me mm. uh, i i think that was very interesting <laughs> yeah it, it was very interesting to me because normally when i read a book not all the books but some books uh, i just read the book try to understand what it is but this book was actually uh, uh, putting me uh, pulling me everywhere uh, in the sense uh, not out of the subject but yeah within the subject but i was trying to draw parallels from the the, the things that i am already introduced to so that way this book was very very interesting and again uh, uh, professor joseph he mentioned that what is the purpose okay i had the question also in my mind so what is the purpose of writing this book mm-hmm. i think we need more books uh, uh, in this way i mean more perspective as well but the purpose is to yeah is, is to uh, uh, make people aware that uh, you know Uh, just by being simple and uh, uh, just by being uh, um, uh, close to the nature, as Tao and Buddhism says that, as uh, Wu Wei says that, you do anything, but you do with the nature, right? So that's again, uh, uh, that's what we call it as Dharma anyway, just being with the nature. And again, the the, the purpose question is something which is very important, which I always like. Like uh, when my daughter, my my daughter is about twelve years old now, and she was seven, eight years old. She asked me a question. Said, "Dad, what is the purpose of life?" We were just t- taking a walk on the beach, and then she asked me the question. What is the purpose of uh, the life? Then I asked him, "Why did you? How did you? Or un- uh, why did you ask this question? Or how did you know that you had to ask this question?" So she gave some stories and everything, or the background thing. But the thing is, I think we all race. uh keep trying to understand what is the purpose of life at some point we will understand yeah this is what it is and book also gives example saying that okay why did tesla build electric cars the purpose is to mm. provide faster sustainable electric transportation why did walmart uh, uh what is the purpose of uh, the, the 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 walmart as an organization so they they provide some answers but we do not know if they are really achieving that or they are getting to through it mm. so Yeah. So the thing is, uh, this uh, this this book is very very fantastic. I think I will have to read it uh, in detail, you know, understand uh, paragraph by paragraph and drawing uh, uh, connections between the text and everything. Uh, but I really enjoyed going through this book uh, because it's uh, this uh, subject of the philosophy is very close to my heart. So I really really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Anand and. Uh... Joseph, I, I see. I'm um, like a good academic. You are making some notes about the questions, so I will I will just go around and get a few, and then you will give you one round of quick responses. So let me ask our dean, um, Dean Sudarshan, to make his comments. Dean, over to you. Thanks, Professor. Uh, thank you, thank you, Naresh. I um, I enjoyed listening to. Um, joseph account of his book um just a little while ago i was doing a a lecture on um, democracy trying to answer the question why have democratic countries even though the poor are in the majority don't serve the needs and well being of the poor i was thinking about it and it's it occurred to me that the problem really is with with the electorate with the people themselves um because they may be induced by you know some goodies that are offered by the electorate or maybe swayed by some promises that are made or maybe induced into thinking that there's some other group that's going to pose a threat to them um, in the case of india the many hindus are made to think that muslims are some kind of a danger all of this so the problem there so when you were speaking i was wondering we do a lot of this uh, these kinds of events we talk to each other um we write books that we read um for others to read and it seemed i mean i was reminded of a comment that uh, a monk made to me in thailand we were talking about democracy in thailand and and he didn't seem to be very bothered that um, 
Thailand was, you know, sort of somewhat democratic, not democratic army taking over and all that. So he said that, you know, a democracy is uh, uh, a people governing themselves, but in order for a people to govern themselves, they must first learn how to govern themselves individually um, as, a, as a person uh, before they become fit uh, to participate in a collective exercise of governance. So it seems to me that one of the things we need to do is to, you know, we have ordinary conversations. We talk to taxi drivers who are taking us somewhere. We talk to the women who are doing gardening on a university campus. But we need some language um, by which we could get, I mean, it's not that, that well, what you're talking about is not, you know, something that's beyond, I mean, you don't need, uh, you know, university degrees and qualifications and, you know, and so on to grasp uh, and to be to introspect and to think about it. So I'm, um, and one of the problems we have, uh, we say in our university is our students just don't have the means to communicate to people who are different from them. Um, you no, know, just one of the language, the idiom, somehow the connectedness. Well, now there is a connectedness, but how do you realize it? I mean, how do you get, you know, and, you know, we, we try to send our students, say, go talk to the villages. Their knowledge is quite important, and, uh, as important as what we teach you and all that. All that very well, but just that. So I'm wondering if you might think of, you know, uh, uh, something like a like a ordinary primer, just to say, when you are talking to somebody else, right? Um, any moment is a good enough moment to to start a reflection of the kind that you you packed into your book, right? You, it makes you think, it makes you pause, you know, and something happens because you paused and thought. How to do this interactively with everyone is my concern, not just with students and with a community that we are in a, an intellectual group of people. That is what I've been thinking about listening to you. So <clears throat> add my thoughts. All right. Very good. Uh, and let's hear from Sudhi. Oh, Professor Patra. Yeah, I think the camera is perhaps. Okay, I think my camera is not uh, working well today. Well, you can try. You can try a superposition. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I was really very uh, very happy to see that uh, uh, there was a lot of connections that Professor Call was making with science, um, and and his reference to Max Planck was really something uh, also quite vital because. You know, Max Planck was um, later on asked many times that how do you get this idea of photon, uh, you know, the, the quanta, mainly quanta. So, and he really always gave the answer that that was his inner consciousness that actually helped him to get this idea of quanta. Um, and so it is very fascinating to see that how the modern revolution in science itself is motivated by consciousness, basically, you know, rather than any kind of objective uh, reality outside, etc. But later on, I will definitely say that um, science has been really very deeply motivated by Buddhist and uh, also Taoist thinking, but as far as I know about Buddhist thinking mainly. Um, say, for example, if you look into even the very modern interpretations of quantum mechanics, for example, cubism and uh, relational quantum mechanics, I think what uh, Professor Call was also referring to, Carlo Rovelli. So they have been very much motivated by this relational aspect of uh, Buddhism. That is, uh, all that matters in this universe is like uh, relations between uh, uh, objects, or relations between uh, uh, decision-making agents. So it is relational ontology that is the most important thing. And I think that that also deeply relates to this kind of you know, the inner core to outer core relation that um, Professor Singh has also mentioned earlier. Um, so these principles, these very deep principles of contextuality, complementarity, um, uh, kind of uh, making decisions under uncertainty, they are not simply natural science or social science, they are present everywhere. They are like kind of all pervading principles. And as far as we see that that is where this 
you know, philosophical frameworks can really help us to understand much better, not kind of like a divide between uh, this science and that science that has all been conventional and also certainly not very fruitful. Um, and uh, coming back to economics mainly, uh, as we see that, you know, till now, uh, we have been very much dominated by this utilitarian framework of uh, utility optimization, which is very much again influenced by this, uh, you know, typical Newtonian worldview. Um, so there again, uh, Buddhist thinking might work uh, uh, kind of really well. But I will de definitely again get back to our Dean's, uh, you know, very, very kind of uh, deep comments that ultimately we really need to reach out to uh, people at large. It is not simply like a kind of esoteric academic debate. And that is like something which uh, we really feel at our center also, that, uh, that, that, that the time has really come out to reach out to people, to outer society, rather than just kind of keep on debating on some uh, typical framework. So I think that this particular book will give us a lot of uh, insights in that area. And maybe we can continue uh, discussing more over time. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yes, thanks, Rudy. Any other quick questions from anyone? I don't see any other hands. But just in case you didn't have a chance to put your hand up, you still have a chance to do so now. If I don't see any, then I will turn it back over. Uh, we are just around that time. I think we have planned. Maybe, well, we have, we have enough time, I believe to give uh, Professor Cole a chance now to respond to a range of a few questions and some comments. So Joseph, back to you. All right, well, thank you so much, Professor, and thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure listening uh, to the comments of Jaya and Anan and also the questions by, by Dean and Sudip. So I'm deeply grateful for that. Um, just well, uh, some, I'm just sharing some reflections that I also got, uh, you know, by, by listening to you. And uh, well, uh, I, I think you beautifully expressed uh, one essential idea that is at the core of the book, um, which is the book does not pretend to be, uh, you know, um, pre prescriptive. No, in, in the way, no, no, you have to do that, that, that. And I think that's something that uh, by reading the book, you know that uh, this, the book is not written by that. Uh, and, and, and the book is written uh, with the intentionality to share some insights and some approaches. And, and I think that you beautifully, uh, both Chai and Anand, um, um, uh, you, uh, when you said that by reading the book, you were making your own connections and you're making your own ways of applying those principles. And that's beautiful. And that's beautiful. And that's why that's the, the main difference between principles and rules, right? So principles just may trigger you, uh, inspire you, may uh, guide some behavior. They don't tell you what to do exactly. <laughs> and that's, 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 right. Why, that's, right. that's why that's why to me that's beautiful, right? So and, and, and when we talk about, and you mentioned the, the, the issue of adaptation, so principles really may help us on that. And, and, and we had a conversation with um, Michael Quinn which I, I had the pleasure to work with together. For those, for those that don't know him, uh, he's been a primary uh, figure in an evaluation to me. Uh, you know, I got to like evaluation thanks to his books. <laughs> and uh, he's been a beautiful praise of the, uh, been writing the beautiful praise of the book, as you, uh, as you know. And, and, and he has a book that's called Principles Based Evaluation, right? A principles Focused Evaluation. And, uh, and, and he always says, uh, if, you, if you focus on, on understanding the principle, uh, you always but automatically because it's you that you are part of the system right so you will contextualize that principle uh, into into the context in which you operate in the context in the work you do in the context in the decisions you have to make to make and taking uh, into consideration the place in which you make those decisions so uh, space and time which are also two fundamental variables in the study of buddhism and, and taoism and this is the chapter uh, the concept of abundance actually talks about that we are always in a, in a particular time and in a particular place. So uh, I think that's fundamental and principles are really helpful for that. So I, did, I really appreciate, I got that insight by listening to you. So thank you and I think, and I think that's, that's, um, that's why um, this book intends to uh, trigger more thinking about this. No? So hopefully, and not only books, but conversations around, around how we apply those principles 
And, and, I, and let me link that to, to what Dean and also Sudi uh, uh, mentioned, which to me is very important. And also you made me uh, realize more and more <laughs> about the importance. Uh, and that, the, of course, having uh, academic debates is nice and we are, it's needed. Eh? It's needed in order to advance part of uh, the dialogue. But of course, in day-to-day -day conversations, in day-to-day -day interactions, here resides the power of those principles. No? And let me just share a story. I, I'm uh, in Seoul. I don't know whether you've been there, uh, but there's a, I, I lived in a place called Yoido, which is by the river. Seoul is divided by one big river, the Han River. And I live just by the river. And every day in the morning, I did my, some, um, some uh, running uh, uh, across the river. Okay, so just by the side. And every day in the morning, it was 7, 7, 10 in the morning, I saw, um, uh, I saw some people, they were uh, old ladies practicing Tai Chi in the park. And I was, uh, 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 well, seeing them every day, every day for some years. And one day, one of the, those ladies approached to me and said, hey, uh, we've been seeing you a lot, right? We don't know who you are, why you are here, obviously, you don't look Korean. <laughs> so uh, uh, she said, why don't you join us for the practice? So they invited me to, to practice Tai Chi and they actually taught me. That was my, my first experience with Tai Chi. And, and we, we started to, to get to know each other. And I was learning Korean at that time. I learned from them. They were also asking questions about me, about my life. So we were developing this, uh, this sense of empathy by working on that interaction because we were sharing some space and some time every day. So to me, that's just an, an anecdote. It's an anecdote, of course, but that, that illustrates you know, the, 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 that sometimes we don't pay enough attention to those meaningful interactions we just have with people that we share the life, right? So, so that would be just a starting point, <laughs> no? just getting interested uh, by the people that we share uh, the lives with and, and, and here you can just expand it uh, to the whole community, to the whole network. And today, well, today we are living in a global world, right? So we are living in a community in a particular moment in time, but then our, uh, the consequences of our actions have also a global outreach, right? And, and that, that makes it more complex. <laughs> so globalization actually ac accelerated the level of complexity in which we live. But, but that, that also um, um, makes it more challenging, but also more beautiful, because we can also be aware, uh, be aware of, of how these small actions and interactions we may have implications at larger scale. And also the same way around, how those global dynamics that influence the way we do things, the way we think about things, uh, also influence our day-to-day -day life. And if we are able to share that uh, and apply those principles in those daily interactions, well, uh, I think that to me, that that could be a really, really a breakthrough in the way we understand consciousness collectively, uh, which to me, and that's also some fundamental idea I've been working and I'm doing deep research on that, not only in Buddhism and Taoism, uh, from other indigenous philosophies as well. And that's, that's one fundamental idea, which, which is very important to me as we approach uh, um, a, a, a tipping point, well, we are in that tipping point, uh, tipping point area of a change of paradigm, which is before it, the different changes of paradigm you know, that, that have been, and it's something that, that has been exploring in books like Spiral Dynamics, the, the works of Beck and Cohen, for example, even Ken Wilber talks about that. Um, so uh, it's been more, the knowledge was residing on some uh, you know, minds of particular people, you know, certain gurus that they got, you know, they were able to channel, to connect with the Tao, with the ultimate knowledge, and they were expressing that knowledge. But this time is different. This time, the knowledge, uh, we have all this knowledge inside. That's why to me, Buddhism and Taoism, which uh, are so important because uh, you know, the idea of the Buddha is that we all have the Buddha inside, right? We have to connect with that wisdom. And the same in Taoism, no? Taoism say that human beings are a small universe that are between heaven and earth, so that we have the whole information of the universe is contained in ourselves. So by, by having this empowerment, this power that, you know, unleashing the power we all have, I think that it's a fundamental idea that we, we no longer have to rely just on few people to tell us what to do. It's just we have to connect with ourselves eh, in order to get into that, you know, particular wisdom we all have, we all share, because it's connected, you know, with this global web of meaning that is the planet Earth and the universe in general.
So I think that's, uh, that, mm -hmm. that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And thank you for that. Before we wrap up, I see Anand wants to make a point. Anand, go ahead. Uh, hi, Professor. This is um, uh, Anantya. Uh, I just uh, have a couple of questions, uh, very basic questions about the book. So when you, when you wrote the book, um, uh, who did you think will be the, say, the immediate audience? Uh, could be policymakers or uh, entrepreneurs or uh, uh, corporate people. So who do you think uh, will benefit the most immediately uh, okay. by reading this book? Okay. Uh, thank you. That's a good question. Well, um, there, are, there are different audiences. To me, there are but mainly two. The first one, uh, the, the first one are, you know, those people that uh, are already working in, in systems level change. Okay, that, that uh, people that may, may just um, enter, you know, system thinking by, by the, by, uh, through system science, no? the science that was developed by general system theories in the 30s and 40s and later to complexity theory in the 60s. So some system scientists, but then also some, there, are, there are people that are natural system thinkers that they don't consider, they have not uh, been educated through system thinking, but they, are, they have this natural tendency uh, uh, to, of being change makers. So that's to me also fundamental. And I can see that uh, some people, you know, be, being very much interested in applying those uh, methodologies uh, in the business world, but not only. For example, one of the, the things I'm seeing is that many policy makers, especially in working in international development, because the realm of that work is, is very much complex. Huh? Uh, so uh, the United Nations particularly, be, uh, but, but also private foundations, uh, large uh, uh, NGOs, are also interested in that. So it's very interesting to see that it has just not a specific audience, but I could see that the common point what they share, people coming from the private sector or the, or, or the public sector, something they share, which they all, they all consider change makers. They all, want, they, will, they all actually sense that we, we are living in this great disconnection between hum, humans and nature. And they will all want to design and find uh, uh, solutions or ways to address you know, uh, uh, the harmful consequences of the economic system in, in which we live in one way or another. So that, 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 that would be the, 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 the fundamental idea behind the, the target of this book. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, I also have a following question. Uh, Prof. Uh, Prof. Naresh, if you don't mind, uh, I have a very basic question again. Uh, the thing is, okay, um, uh, Prof, when you, when you wrote this book, you you uh, went through certain things in life, you had experience, uh, uh, you, you went through whatever you went through and then you started uh, getting the idea of writing the book and probably after 15 years, as you mentioned, you completed this book. So now you are a practitioner of certain uh, uh, ways of doing things. Um, so uh, when we talk about the future generations, uh, when do you think that future generations should start no learning these things. Okay, why this question arises is that when you talk about the modern education that uh, we all go through right now, uh, us and also our uh, no, the, the next generation and the future generation. Uh, the the way the uh, the way the education happens, I'm also part. I mean, I'm also a product of the modern education anyway. Uh, so uh, we are not taught about any of these things when we are uh, you know, kids or in the, in the formative years. For uh, so, what is your take on introducing uh, the uh, spirituality or the philosophical studies uh, right from the formative years itself? Um, so, how would that transform? Uh, for example, if I hypothesize that if uh, the future generations are, say, uh, exposed to uh, philosophical studies, not the complex ones, but the uh, but at that age, whatever is, is uh, conducive for the age. Can we see a change in mindset of the people, say in one or two generations, for example? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And it's a question that really concerns me. And I, maybe I don't, I don't have yet uh, answers, but uh, I have some ideas. <laughs> And I welcome you also if you are interested in developing those ideas together. Eh? But it's definitely uh, one of my main concerns now. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm, um, um, I've been, um, uh, well, you know, part of, part, part of my uh, professional life, uh, I, I devoted uh, at the university, at a business school. We introduced that uh, since uh, 2015. Uh, we designed actually the uh, first uh, sustainable business and innovation program uh, with these ideas in mind, I, and that uh, I, I actually use the same business model. 
as part of it. It was the first program in Europe on that. And, and uh, there, there was a lot of resistance, uh, the, the business school people saying, oh, how come talking about these things? <laughs> we are a business school, right? And, but then the yeah. question was, well, but why, what kind of business school do you want to be, <laughs> right? And uh, so we started that program and now it's been the fastest, larger, the, the uh, uh, growing program in the business school and we created more programs. And even now uh, uh, business schools from other parts of the world are uh, uh, asking us uh, to, to share some insights and, and we are doing, of course, because this is something collective. But, but then there's the issue of early, early ages, no? which is a now uh, a, very, a very important one. I think, I think um, well, you know that changing systems can come from different points, right? We call it leverage points. And I think it's very interesting. Uh, we have to work in different dimensions. So the dimensions right. of of people that work in the systems already, you know, this is very important, no? the, the, the ones that uh, we are in systems, so how we work in systems, how we try to repurpose what systems do, I think we, we still have to do that. But of course, then next generations, uh, uh, in order to avoid uh, the, the harsh work, uh, sometimes very interesting, but that we all uh, are doing, which is about unlearning and learning. So offering them new uh, 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 learning frameworks which are based uh, 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 about nature, right? Which take nature as role model and spirituality taps here, it fits very well in here, is key. Uh, the, 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 the development work, the inner development work, which is needed for sustainable development in early ages, to me, that's a challenge. I can see, I, I, I live in, in, in a particular way and that's why I live here, not in Barcelona city. I live uh, uh, 40, 40 minutes uh, far in, a, a natural park, which it's a, a very beautiful mountain called El Mutsen. And we are developing example, we are testing things here. And we are developing, uh, for example, my son goes to a forest school. It's, it was a school created two years ago, um, where, where they just uh, are in nature. It's a nomad school. They don't have a particular place. They change, they go to the forest and they, they learn things by being in nature and they put the things together in nature. So, so th th there are approaches uh, like Montessori, also Waldorf, not, not like this, eh? this, this may be just focus on nature. Um, so, but I can, and this is not the only one, uh, we are creating also a web of different approaches and projects we are seeing. It's very local yet, very local, but it's a way okay. that, that I think it's very important to start regenerating, uh, you know, there's the local ecosystems, naturally mm -hmm. and socially, and education is fundamental, fundamental. So I'm also now uh, starting working on a, uh, actually on a book for kids uh, uh, on how to also apply them and, and I'm getting ideas from them. <laughs> I'm sharing those with them and, and they are natural systems thinkers. Kids are very creative. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and we can learn a lot also from them. So it's something very natural. Once, once we just uh, uh, put the frameworks there, I think for them it's very natural to grasp the meanings behind that. Exactly. I think kids are uh, yeah, we'll have spiritual to, anyway. We'll have to wrap it up. Yes, Prof. I'm actually done. Okay. So before I turn it over to uh, to Chesta to uh, to bring us to a close, let me just say, yeah, the, you know, the point that Dean Sudarshan raised and uh, echoed by uh, Sudip as well. I have worked for several years on an approach to poverty reduction called the sustainable livelihoods approach. And that approach is a systemic way of thinking about poverty reduction and so on. What I found was that the people and the communities, people living in poverty, lived that systemic reality. It was the policy makers in UNDP in New York and elsewhere in governments who could not relate to it because the people do not live in the silos of the ministries of government, for example, or the departments of the UN system. They lived in a naturally systemic way. And uh, I realized that my big challenge was how to communicate with people who went to school, not those who did not go to school. It was how would I communicate and change ideas? How would I communicate to policymakers? One of the big divides that we face is that policymakers cannot relate to systems thinking. Oh yes, there are a few and there are growing now in numbers, but still far too small. So I will still say that, and I think that our comparative advantage is in fact dealing with the educated, dealing with the policymakers where the problem really lies. 
it's these policies that are driving this planet into a, into a highly unsustainable state. And of course, the very wealthy who are consuming the 20% the, the of the very wealthy who are over consuming. Yes, we have uh, a whole bunch of people living in poverty who are under consuming and that can benefit from policies if only the policymakers will understand and have the political guts to move forward. So those are my final closing remarks from my side. But uh, let me turn now to Chester. Thanks uh, from, my, from me, uh, Joseph. Thank you so much for taking your time on two occasions. You have now set us on a trajectory where you cannot back out but collaborate with us to take that forward. But let me now ask Chester to make some concluding uh, remarks and say thanks. Over to you, Chester. Thank you, Professor Singh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, present my closing remarks. Uh, we have actually been fortunate enough to listen to Professor Paul twice this week, and we've been learning of how, uh, just if I some, uh, briefly summarize in one line, we have actually now have a clear idea of how to connect applied spirituality and systems thinking to go into the public policy domain of making sustainable policies to mindfully reinvent and create policies and decision makings which are all driving a systemic transformation and we have actually got the clear idea of that uh, as professor singh was mentioning uh, in the previous semester we did have a course on systems thinking and in this semester we have an applied spirituality so we have actually again uh, bridged the gap between the both and we we i again uh, agree with you that we do not uh, need bridges we are the bridges and uh, we really uh, like that uh, sentence that you ended your conversation today, as well as the presentation we had uh, on Wednesday. Uh, but uh, for me, I think this feels like, and for maybe everyone who are here, it feels like a full package of how the uh, thinking can be transformed and implemented through models, through everything that goes into really making and reinventing and creating sustainable policies and decisions. So uh, we are really looking forward to having you with us on all the collaborations that we can. For, the, for most of the core and focused areas of the center, we have really started bridging the gaps between both. And uh, everyone, thank you for joining. We are, on behalf of everyone here, we are congratulating you for the new book. We are encouraging everyone to read about this and take all of all the ideas forward as we have been learning through the lecture as well as today's uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Call, for joining us. Uh, many congratulations and our sincere thanks to you. Thank you, Professor Singh. Uh, thank you, Professor Sudarshan and Professor Patra for also joining us and uh, commenting on and questioning, uh, uh, in, uh, making it an interactive session. Thank you, Jaya and Anand, for really uh, leading this work in a very short time and uh, really bringing your comments here. Uh, really appreciate how uh, Jaya presented a brief summary for everyone who did not go through the book yet, but uh, uh, Anand also made the point of dharma, and I think even I could relate to that. So many thanks to all of you. Uh, thank you to everyone who are actually here and uh, coming here on Saturday afternoon, we know it's a weekend. But thanks all of you, thank you IT for helping with all this and thank you everyone. Thank you, Professor Paul. All thank right, you so thank much. you, sir. Thanks, Joseph, we'll keep in touch. Bye thank now. you so much and keep in touch, looking forward to it. All the yeah, rest of Of course, of course. Bye-bye, bye-bye all, take care. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Professor, thank you so much. Rahul sir, aap recording stop kar dena.